Well, good morning, church. Good to see you. You guys had a finger check before just to make sure nothing blew up. Um, I've seen some of those fail videos. But for just a moment, can we thank God that we live in a country where we can worship freely? Can we just thank him for that? We can take that for granted. I'm thankful to live in a free country. But freedom isn't free. There's those who have paved the way for us, who have fought for us. I'm th so thankful for that. You know, uh, if, if you didn't know, I'm Clark. It's nice to meet you. I oversee the worship and creative areas here at the church. And uh, when I get to speak, it is an honor, but it also is nerve-wracking because you have a headset mic attached to you wherever you go. And so I was so nervous using the bathroom, I almost didn't want to go at all because you, I checked it at least five times. Is it off? Okay. Did I accidentally put it? No. No, we're good. We're good. But I'm glad to be here with you guys. Um, something about me, I'm a, I'm a bit of a rule follower. So somebody said this week that I'm a, a bit of a rule follower. You know, in high school, they might have called me straight edge, you know, um, the worst people would say I was a, you know, pet peeve or something like, or a, a pet, um, teacher's pet. I wouldn't say any of those things. Because guess what? I have a story of when I broke the rules. One singular story. Now, I have more than one story, but I do have one story that I want to share. It was fifth grade in Miss Laranaga's class. Miss Laranaga, if you're watching, I don't know if you got married or if you're still Miss Laranaga. I'm so sorry this happened to you. But I was, I love Miss Laranaga, and it was the last month of school in your fifth grade year. So you're about to go to middle school. So I'm, you know, everybody's spirits are high. It feels like, wow, the next thing is coming. We always did a monthly party where the parents would come in and we'd celebrate then the May birthdays. And we we're excited to do so. So we had candy and games and there was a cupcake and I grabbed a cupcake and I was, I don't know, I, it was just in my hand. I thought I was going to give it to Miss Laranaga. I don't know what came over me, but all of a sudden I just like, whoop, right in her face. I, fifth grade Clark, can you imagine it? And I'm just stunned. She's stunned. I'm stunned. Like there's icing over her eyes, but then you see the, the whites of her eyes open <laughs> through the icing. And this is the worst. It was silence. She said nothing. She just stared, waited a moment, and left the classroom. And there was a hush and a little bit of a ooh. <laughs> like, and I am sweating bullets. The, the five minutes I was waiting there felt like an eternity. I was thinking about all the ways I was going to be doomed. I was going to be held back. I was not going to pass the class. I was going to have to repeat fifth grade. I, I didn't know. Um, but sure enough, she came back and she said, we're going to come to the principal's office. Oh, that's the worst thing a rule follower can hear. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking of all the worst case scenarios. Little did I know that Miss Laranaga had gone to Miss Adams, and this was the principal, and told her what had happened. And so they devised the plan to get back at me. They had called my mom beforehand and said, hey, we know Clark's a good student. I'm assuming she, they said this, but we're going to get back at him. <laughs> We're going to get back at him, and we're going to call you in a couple minutes with Clark here in the office, and we're going we're gonna to act like he's in big trouble, okay? So I get in, and I'm on the verge of tears as I'm calling my mom. My mom's like, so what do you think we should do, honey? What do you think's a, a fair punishment here? And I'm just, I don't know, take away my toys. I don't know. Whatever a fifth grader thought was the worst, but they had gotten me back. I'm sure you've had a moment like that, too where you've broken the rules, some of you more than others. <laughs> but we've had those moments of, of breaking the rules. Maybe we, our eyes wandered to the person's test next to us. Adam and Coy, I'm talking to you. That was fourth grade. Um, <laughs> maybe you took advantage of being the banker in Monopoly. Your hands were a little sticky. Maybe... You do the Christian five, you know, five over the speed limit, you know, because 
The law enforcement, they say five is fine, but nine, you're mine. So the Christian five, maybe you didn't wash your hands over the last week when you used the restroom. Maybe you've broken the rules. This is just a human rule is that you don't put milk in before the cereal. Maybe that's you. That's your rule breaking. Or maybe you've gotten a little creative with your taxes. I don't know. Whatever it looks like, we've all had moments, whether you're a rule follower or not, where we've colored outside of the lines. And today, this message is for you, whether you're a rule follower or you're someone who likes to break the rules. So, I want to review really quick what's happened in Acts. We're in the book of Acts. We're doing this, you know, decade-long series in Acts. We're going to be there forever. But it's great because it forces us to talk about things that we wouldn't necessarily talk about, like rule-breaking. So in Acts chapter 3, we see Peter. He prays for a a man who's paralyzed outside of the temple, and he's healed. Uh, It's incredible. Peter sees his opportunity. You guys remember that? He sees his opportunity and preaches the word of God, and thousands get saved. But there's this group called the Sadducees. They were political, well, religious leaders with political motivations, and they didn't like it, and so they threw Peter and John into jail and said, you can't be doing that. And they ask them, you know, what, by what authority are you doing this? And they boldly proclaim, it's Jesus whom you crucified. And Peter speaks up, he shares about Jesus. And this is where we pick up in verse 13 of Acts chapter 4. When they, the Sadducees, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I love this verse. I love this verse because in our own minds, we can often disqualify ourselves. We can be our own worst critics. We can think, I'm not them. I'm not good enough. I don't have the education. But God, right here in this section of scripture uses ordinary people. It's kind of a dig, you know, on Peter and John. They were unschooled, uh, ordinary. But guess what? God uses the ordinary, the not qualified. He qualifies them and he does astonishing things through them, through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why it's so important. We talked about this in Acts chapter two, to have the baptism, the infilling of the spirit so that we can do things that in our own strength that we wouldn't be able to do. And this is what they're doing. And they had seen that they had been with Jesus. Can I tell you, people know, they can kind of sniff out whether you've been with Jesus or not. They may not be able to quite put their finger on what it is, but they can sniff it out. And in verse 14, continuing on, but since they, again the Sadducees, could see the men had, that the man, the paralytic man, had been healed, he was standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone in Jerusalem knows that they've performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them no longer to speak to anyone in this name. That's the name of Jesus. So the Sanhedrin, this is the, the council of, of like Jewish leaders, and they make rules, and we're going to see an instance of a rule breaker. Remember, these guys, the Sadducees, had political agendas. They were looking to stamp out this new movement, this new Jesus following, but they weren't wanting to upset the people who had obviously seen the miracle. And it was crazy. They could see the miracle right in front of their face, but they still couldn't see. So in verse 18, then they, again the Sadducees, called, called them, Peter, John, and the healed man, in. And they commanded them not to speak or teach at all, like no teaching, no speaking in the name of Jesus at all. But Peter and John replied, here's where it gets real, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. Man, that's a statement right there. Next time, kids, don't use that for your own advantage. (laughs) They say, as for us, we cannot help 
but speak about what we have seen and heard. Uh-oh, we've got some rule breakers here. All the rule breakers are like, yes, stick it to them. Tell them what's up. This is the first example we see in Acts of what we'll call civil disobedience. The first time we see civil disobedience. What is civil disobedience? It's the refusal to comply with certain laws or to pay taxes and fines as a peaceable, peaceful form of political protest. We see this also in the very next chapter of Acts, in cha- Acts chapter 5. Peter and the apostles are in a similar situation, and they say something very similar. They say, we must obey God rather than men. So here's the question. Can Christians be rule breakers? Can we color outside of the lines? To what extent can we disobey the governing authorities? You know, what do we do when we run into this this conflict? Do we shove the cupcake into the teacher's face? If you're going to title this message today, you could title it this, The Art of Rule Breaking. Oh, who would have thought I would be given this message? The Art of Rule Breaking. I want to give us a framework today for this tension that we're in. You could consider it the rules for rule breaking, if you will. In the words of Captain Barbosa, it's more of a guideline. That's a, that's a deep Pirates of the Caribbean reference. Here's the first thing. If we want to be outlined the rules for rule breaking, the first thing we have to understand is this. We are first and foremost citizens of heaven. We are first and foremost citizens of heaven. This is what Philippians 3.20 says. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to know that our first allegiance is to Jesus. And let me tell you, I love being an American. We just had 4th of, 4th of July. It's my favorite holiday. I feel patriotic. I consider myself patriotic. And, but can, can we do a little side note really quick? Can we all agree that 12 o'clock at night is the time that fireworks should cease? We are no longer on July 4th. We are on July 5th. We had two hours of darkness to get your fireworks in. Neighbor, I'm talking to you at 2 a.m. with the mortars above my house. I love you. I love you. But come on. It's no longer July 4th. You missed it. But I love it. I love the 4th of July because it is the most freedom holiday ever. You get to do whatever you want. If you want to go camping, like that's how you like to enjoy your freedom, go camping. I've fished and camped on many occasions on the 4th of July. If you like blowing things up in pyrotechnics, you get to celebrate. If you want to just chill and do a barbecue, hang by the pool, you can do it. You can do whatever you want on the 4th of July. There's not the family obligations or you know, half to this, half to that. This is what John Adams, who's a founding father of our, our um, country, he's also the second president of the U.S., when he had signed the, or, or wrote, helped write the Declaration of Independence, this is what he wrote in a letter talking about this. The second day of July, 1776. Now, the dates were a little bit off. It wasn't quite finalized, so he's a couple days off. But basically, the 4th of July will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. And I'm apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations. Here we are, almost 200 plus, how many ever years that is, later, celebrating it. As the great anniversary festival, it ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance. Check this out. By solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. John Adams knew what this meant and who we should celebrate. And he goes on, it ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade. There was a lot of parades going on. With shoes, I don't know what that means. Games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations. Hello, fireworks, somebody. Let's blow things up. From one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. Man, what what a great glimpse into what the 4th of July could be. And I love 
I love being an American. But before I'm an American, I am first and foremost a citizen of heaven. I am first and foremost a citizen of heaven. Before you're anything, fill in the blank, you're a citizen of heaven. Because we wear a lot of hats. Jeff, he's my hat man today. He's, he's outfitting me with all the right hats. We wear a lot of hats. Like It might be your, nas- your nationality hat, your citizen hat. I'm an American. I'm Mexican. I'm Chinese, whatever it might be. Or it might be your heritage hat. You may not be a citizen of that place, but you have maybe your Basque or, you know, you, you've got um, Eastern heritage or maybe Russian. Who knows? There's that hat you wear. And there's also maybe the familial hat. Maybe your mom, dad. This is my best dad hat that I could get. Maybe your brother, your sister. That's a, that's a hat you wear. Maybe it's your job hat. You know, we often have occupations. This hat is, this is NASA, so maybe working at NASA. Maybe you're not that parent, but you're a teacher, or, or maybe you're a student. You work in construction. That's a hat you can wear. Maybe it's your, your hobby hat, Bass Pro Shops. You're a fisherman. You're a golfer. You like sewing. That's a hat you wear. Maybe it's your, your belief hat. Right? You've got morals. Celebration represent. <laughs> but there's another hat. There's another hat. It might be the political philosophy hat. My wife, in all her wisdom, said, maybe don't bring a political philosophy hat today. <laughs> so I didn't. <laughs> but with every hat, every hat has a different preference. It has a different opinion. It has a different motivation. And we all do this. We all have these different hats we wear. They have different identities. But what do we do when these hats contradict? Because as Christians, we first and foremost, we have to wear this hat. It's called the kingdom hat. I got it because it's the biggest one. This is actually my fishing hat. It's, you know, large and in charge. We maybe missed a chance for merch hats right now. Citizen of heaven. Someone make it. But there's a hat that says, I'm a citizen of heaven first. And if we're citizens of heaven, we have to align ourselves with some motivations, some preferences, some identities. And that has to align with the word of God. And if we align ourselves with the word of God, it means we follow the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We have a king who's ruling his kingdom, and our preferences should yield to the word of God and not the other way around. And because we're citizens of heaven, that means we're aligning ourselves with the word of God. And when we align ourselves with the word of God, that means we have to understand biblical authority. So if you want another rule for rule breaking, here it is. You have to have a biblical view of authority. Now, this is something in culture that's come up a lot. We, we've been hitting our heads against this wall in culture. What to do with authority, specifically ones we don't agree with. Check this out in Titus 3. Remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and always be gentle toward everyone. And in 1 Peter, this is what it says about authority. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Anybody glad they came to church today to talk about authority? Look, this applies to all level of authority. It's parents, it's government, it's coaches, it's teachers, it's law enforcement. Because to understand the kingdom of God, you have to understand authority. It's, you have to understand God's authority. You have to understand the authority that God gives us as believers. And you also have to understand how to relate to earthly authority. 
There's the story of the centurion man who amazed Jesus by his faith. And it was in, a, in relation to how authority works. He understood earthly authority and applied it to kingdom authority. But someone right now is like, but surely, when Peter and Paul were writing this scripture, they didn't know the presidents we've had. Like, come on. Real dictators they've been. Whatever you believe. Well, actually... They were under one of the most horrific leaders there has ever been in human history. There's this guy I want to introduce you to. His name is Nero. I actually don't want you to introduce him to you, but he's horrific. We got to talk about him. He was a Roman emperor. Here's how he got to power. He poisoned family members to get to the throne. And once he got to the throne, he lusted after his mom and then later had had her killed. While he was in power, he mutilated the people under him and forced them to marry him. He's the one who set fire to Rome and then blamed it on the Christians, which started 300 years of violent persecution against them. Like the most horrific acts of killings you can imagine. And it's written, it's documented, it's historically documented what he did to them. Just horrific. And we've probably got kids in the room, so I'm not going to go into it. But this is the context in which Paul and Peter are writing when they're talking about submitting and being subject to governing authority. Say what you will, have your preference, but I I think this is the first thing we have to get right. Number one, when it comes to having a biblical view of authority, we we have to submit or be subject to authority. We have to submit or be subject to authority. And what, the reason I think we've started really butting up against this is we've started idolizing our own preferences over the word of God. We've idolized what makes us feel great, what our opinions are, but opinions are like feet. We all have them and they stink. (laughs) My family would use a different word other than feet. Maybe your family was like my family. But we've all got our political preferences, there's sexual preferences, there's financial preferences when you start doing your taxes. I want more of the money, not less of the money. But as for me, I want to know what does the Bible say about it? What does the word of God say about it? And that's how I want to align myself, is to the word of God. This is what 1 Peter says, we just talked about it. When it comes to submitting to authority, submit yourselves. For whose sake? The Lord's sake. It's unto the Lord, to every human authority. And he says, whether to the emperor or to someone under him, like the governor. Number two, if we want to understand biblical authority, we have to understand that God is the one who establishes authority. This is what it says in Romans 13. Don't don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger. This This is what... The Lord says about authority is let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, this might be messing with someone right now because because you're like, wait, why would God establish someone like Nero? And we don't have time for that, but we're supposed to be subject to them. Number three, to understand biblical authority, we have to respect or honor positions of authority. First Peter chapter two says, show proper respect to only the people you like. <laughs> Wait, no, that's not it. Show proper respect to the political party that you align. Wait, 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 wait. Everyone, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Wow. Romans 13. I'm messing with someone right now. I can feel you. You're like, "Mm, wrong date. Come to church. It's good for you. It is. Romans 13 says this. Give to everyone what you owe them. If if you owe taxes, pay taxes. (laughs) If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. 
And in Titus 3, it says, remind people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. Check this out. Slander no one. Slander no one. This is going to be so important coming up. This is an election year. It's going to get spicy. (laughs) It's going to get spicy. But as Christians, we slander no one. But we respect them to be peaceable and considerate and always to be gentle toward everyone. Okay, number four, and ways to understand biblical authority is we pray for people in authority. That's not my, he's not my leader. No, pray for people in authority. Pray for those in authority. First Timothy 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants people to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. It doesn't matter if you disagree with someone in authority. You can pray for them, and you should pray for them. So here's the question, though. But what if it contradicts the word of God? Okay, what do we do? Okay, now now the rule breakers rejoice. It's time to talk about how we can break rules. Yes. Who are the rule followers in the room? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see you. I I knew I couldn't ask who the rule breakers were because you wouldn't have raised your hand. You'd have been like, I'm not doing what he says. I'm not doing it. Okay, so here, the rule breakers, this is when you get to break the rules. You have permission here. Uh, this is DJE Atwood when, in his um, writing, Civil Disobedience. These are the situations, there's two situations that warrant civil disobedience. And this is from viewing scripture. When believers are required, number one, when believers are required to deny their faith in Christ, or explicitly disown him. So this was, if we look back at Acts, this is part of why Peter and John were able to say, we can't help but, but speak in the name of Jesus. We can't help but talk about it because they wouldn't disown their faith. Or number two, this is when you could disobey, is when the state or whatever governing authority has required Christians to take part in an action which is in clear conflict with their Christianly informed conscience. So, so if you were going to look back at Acts chapter 4, this is what happens in Acts chapter 5. When they say, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or him, you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And in Acts chapter 5, we see this also. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And if you wanted to read further this, this quote, this outline of when it's warranted to disobey, there's actually six more guidelines of helping shift, like, what are the right circumstances and in which way should we conduct ourselves? Because notice Peter and Paul, or sorry, uh, Peter and John did not rise up and say, let's start a coup. Like, let's take over. They just had like 5,000 people saved. They had the people to do it. They could have, but they didn't. So the way in which you do it matters. So when is civil disobedience allowed? Here's, Here's those same words, just a little bit more simplified. Number one, if it requires you to deny your faith. You don't have to follow that rule. Rule breakers, you can break that rule. Yes. (laughs) Number two, requires you to do or not do something in contradiction to God's word. So if it contradicts God's word and they're asking you to, making you do it or not do it, you don't have to do it. Rule breakers rejoice. But anything else is off limits from what I see in scripture, that we don't have any other outs. Let's check out another rule breaker. You want some rule breaking stories? I'll give you rule breaking stories, okay? This one's not me, this is Daniel, the same Daniel who was thrown into the pit of lions. 
he was a little background. He was a believer under King Darius, who was ruling Babylon. This was the same Babylon that wreaked havoc on the people of God. They, they took a lot of people of God out of their home in Jerusalem and took them into exile, and Daniel is one of them. And Daniel, what we know about him through scripture is he's presumably one of the noblemen. So here he is serving in Babylon, not a godly nation, not a godly system or ruling. But here he is, he's serving as, a, as a, an official under King Darius. And this is where we pick up in Daniel 6. Let's check out his rule-breaking story. Verse 3, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Look, even in serving in an ungodly environment, he thrives. He thrives. When we work, I don't care who your boss is, your teacher, whatever, when we work, it's under the Lord. It's under the Lord. Unto the Lord. And verse 4, then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful. He was always responsible and completely trustworthy. Christians, believers in the room, you don't have to compromise your character in an ungodly environment. You know you can still represent God well in your character and how you act. And this is what Daniel's doing. He represented God well in the way he conducted himself. And in verse five, so they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So these officials that did like him, they devise a plan. We're gonna find some way to get him out of here And so they trick the king into signing a law that would forbid anyone from worshiping someone else other than the king. And then here's where we pick up in verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. With his windows open open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. What does Daniel do? He breaks the rules because it contradicted God's word. It contradicted the point number two. But he gets caught. The officials know what they were doing and they were going to trick him. He gets caught. He gets thrown into a lion's den. Now, the king actually liked Daniel, and, but he couldn't contradict the law that he had just put in place. So he ended up having to throw Daniel into the lion's den. And this is what happens next, is that very early the next morning, the king got up, hurried out to the lion's den, and when he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, You're mean. Why'd you do that? (laughs) You stink. I don't like you. He says, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I've been found innocent, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. Christians, believers, here's how some of the rules for rule breaking. How you conduct yourself matters. How you conduct yourself matters. Daniel disobeyed, but let's check out what he didn't do. Notice that his words weren't dishonoring. He didn't slander. He didn't sin. He didn't even resist the the punishment for his outlawed action. He was subject to the laws. Now, he didn't compromise his beliefs, but he was subject to the law. He didn't give King Darius the finger. You know, he wasn't like, you stink. You know, you in Babylon, trying to figure out PC words here. Philippians, (laughs) 
I only have PC words in my vocabulary. It's the only thing I have. Philippians 1 says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. Doing what? Conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Let's conduct ourselves in a manner that pleases God, that's worthy of the gospel. Then whenever, whenever I come to you and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together in one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for a political agenda. No. For the faith, which is the good news. You can disagree and still honor. Here's another rule for, for rule breaking. You can, you can disagree. You probably do disagree with a lot of different things, but you can still honor yeah. in any circumstance. Whether you really like this president or the last president or the president before that or keep on going, doesn't matter. You can disagree with your boss, your parents, the authorities. You may have heard it said, respect is not given, but it's earned. It's not the Bible. Back to First Peter, it says, show proper respect to everyone. And in Romans 13, give everyone what you owe them. If respect, then respect. You know, there's a challenging story um, there's this guy named Brother Yun. I, I believe we have a picture of him. This is a, uh, a Chinese Christian who had an incredible salvation story. He, he writes his memoir called The Heavenly Man. And he was someone who, once he was saved in communist suppressed China, he helped start this incredible movement of underground churches in the 80s and 90s. There was people saved, miracles followed, but there was also great persecution. People were beaten and tortured and killed and jailed. You can go on. Under this communist government, China, he was a rule breaker, but for the gospel. So if the government said, you can't preach about the name of Jesus, you can't, you can't have a Bible, you can't have the word of God, he was a rule breaker. But when he was asked by his Western friends, because eventually he went to Germany, he had to escape to Germany, and he writes his memoir, and so he, he gets um, known pretty well. And so Western people you know, from Europe and America are asking him, what about the Chinese government? Do you, do you want to pray against it? Do you want it to be overturned? Like, do you want a democracy like ours? You know, that kind of thing. And here's what he answered when it comes to his view on the government. He says, we never pray against our gover government or call down curses on them. Instead, we have learned that God is in control both of our own lives and the government we live under. God has used China's government for his own purposes, molding and shaping his children as he sees fit. Instead of focusing our prayers against any political system, we pray that regardless of what happens to us, we will be pleasing God. Now, this might be challenging for, for a lot of us, depending on what our philosophy is in this area. But can we say, can I say this, that there are some gray areas that we need to talk about. If, if there's rules for rule breaking, it's how to conduct yourself also in the gray areas. Because the Bible addresses that there's gray areas. In Romans, Paul talks about some dietary ha habits. There was Christians and the, the Gentiles and the Jews, and they were trying to figure out what do we follow, what do we still not follow as Christians. And so there were gray areas with dietary habits or when to observe, observe sacred days. Is this day sacred or is it more this day? In 1 Corinthians, he talks about what do we do if there's food offered to idols? Is it bad to eat that food? And for some people it was, and they felt like they were violating God's law, and other people were like, no, it's okay. And what does Paul say 
with these gray areas. In chapter 14, verse 5, he says, concerning these things, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. You should seek the Lord on these things, in these gray areas. Let me bring up a gray area we all love to talk about. 2020, somebody. That brought up a lot of gray areas, didn't it? One of the gray areas I remember, because I remember it fondly because I was in the middle of it, is whether we open church or, or we don't. Because I think this is a gray area because we, we had two groups who were both trying to follow God, do what was right, and align themselves with the word of God. One person would look at scripture and, and see, we've got to love our neighbor. And they felt like loving our neighbor looked like protecting them potentially from a deadly virus. And another group said, well, we don't forsake the gathering together, right? And then we had these two warring sides, and I don't think they were very nice. <laughs> there was this tension. There was a, a gray area or a couple other gray areas, maybe World War II, if you're familiar with that, this, this idea of conscientious objectors, like, I don't want to kill, but the government is drafting me, drafting me, do I, what do I do as a Christian? Maybe you've seen Hacksaw Ridge. That's a great, a great movie, a great example of what to do in those kind of situations. Or what do we do in, in countries that persecute Christians, right? What kind of, ex, what extent do we cooperate with them or work underneath them? Like, what extent do we do? And I would say in those gray areas, let's seek God and be fully convinced in our own mind and have grace toward those we disagree with. Because we can disagree and still honor. How we conduct ourselves matters. So here, here's maybe another question is what difference do we make? What participation do we have in this civilian life? I would say for us in our country, participate in civilian life, right? There's a voting cycle coming up, and you should vote your conscience. I hope it's aligned with the word of God. You should vote your conscience. conscience, And you should also help prosper the community that you're planted in. Plant roots. Be fruitful. That's godly to multiply, to, to be someone who's wanting to create a better community to bring heaven here on earth. I think you should exercise your civil liberties as, as much as it's aligned with God. I think of the Baptist minister, you may know him, Martin Luther King Jr., who, who led the civil rights movement. And check out how he conducted himself. In a moment when his house was bombed, his kids were in there, his wife was in there, thankfully they weren't hurt. In a moment where his house was bombed, there was a lot of people in his movement who were ready with, with weapons, like ready to go fight people who did this. And this was Martin Luther King's words. Don't get your weapons. If you have weapons, take them home. He who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. We are not advocating for violence. We want to love our enemies. Now, that sounds to me like someone who's aligned with the word of God, who knows how to conduct himself. I want to caution Christians when we come up to this election cycle. There's political wars. There's culture wars. There's a lot going on. And how you conduct yourself in the middle of that, it matters. It matters. Because what do you do with the cupcake in Miss Larinaga's class it matters what you do with that. Sorry, Miss Larinaga. I still love you. But rule breaking is an art. Because what good is it to stand for something you believe in and sin in the process? I've seen Christians take a stand. I've got grace for you. All of, all, for, I need grace too. But I've seen Christians take a stand but if you were to look at their footing, it wasn't planted on the word of God. Instead, it was a different motivation. It was a different hack. It was a different philosophy. It was a different identity. 
So next time you take a stand, I want you to just ask yourself and ask the Lord, where's, where's this coming from? Is this my personal motivation? Is this my personal preference? Because we all have those. That's fine. But they should all be submitted to the hat that says, I'm the, a citizen of heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. I have a king who rules his kingdom. I want to go back to Philippians 1. As the band makes their way up. In verse 27, it says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. Live as citizens of heaven. This world is not our home. You should be conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. And then when I come and see you again or only hear about you, I know that you are standing together in one spirit, one purpose, undivided, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. There's going to be people, you may have heard them, they say things like, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. I like Jesus, but those Christians, oh, I'm not so sure about them. We see this in Daniel 6 when Darius sees that he's alive, that Daniel is alive. How Daniel conducted himself mattered because what does Dan, or Derek, King Darius do? He's, we see this in verse 25 of chapter 6. Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. Darius isn't a godly ruler, but here he is able to recognize what God is doing in Daniel's life. And of course, he sees the miracle, but I think he also sees his character, how he conducted himself in, this, in the middle of a misunderstanding. If there was ever a moment for someone to be offended, like Daniel, and lash out, it would be when someone throws you into a lion's den for a messed up reason. <laughs> but we see throughout scripture these characters who even though they're not the top dog, they're not the one in charge, they submit themselves to an ungodly authority while still not compromising their beliefs. You could look at Pharaoh when Joseph served under him and he prospered. We can see Daniel here. We could see David. Even when Saul was trying to kill him, he took a stand and he said, I'm not gonna touch the Lord's anointed. He understood biblical authority. So how we conduct ourselves matters. But I'm just, I don't know if anyone's here with me. You're tracking with me. Rule breaker or not. But there's another hat that we've got to let go of. And it's the hat that says me, myself, and I. There's another allegiance that we can have, and it's to our own self, where we put our self, our own preferences, our own beliefs, our own whatever, before the word of God, before being a citizen of heaven. I wonder if there's anyone who's in this room who's hearing me, and they've recognized maybe I've messed up my priorities, and I've been more allegiant to myself and my own opinions and how I think things should be run than how God thinks things should be run. Maybe you've dishonored in the process. You've slandered. Maybe you've just not conducted yourself worthy of, a, of the gospel. That can all change. I wonder if there's some people who want to renew your citizenship to heaven, if you will, saying, now first and foremost, 
the hat that I proudly put on every day, above everything else, is the hat that says, Jesus is king. He's my Lord. I align myself with the word of God. Everything else comes second. Would you stand with me today? I felt like this might have been something for a young person in the room who, whether you've had problems with authority or not, you're up and coming and you've got ambitions. You, you feel like maybe you're a leader or God's calling you to be a leader, maybe a business owner in some level of authority. This one, can I plead with you? This one matters. To understand the kingdom of God is to understand authority because we ourselves have a ruler, King Jesus. And it says that in the Bible that God resists the proud. And so if we can't figure out this one of submitting underneath those we're under authority, it says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You want God to bless your leadership? You want to be in authority? Learn how to be under authority. Learn how to be, like this scripture I just referenced says, humble. Because he gives grace to the humble. Humble, to be made low, to say like, I, I don't think so highly of myself that I can't submit to the word of God. I yield to King Jesus. So if, for just a moment, everyone would just maybe close your eyes, bow your heads. I just wonder if there's anyone who wants to lay themselves down, who wants to put the hat of me, myself, and I to the wayside and say, I'm allegiant to Jesus first. This is maybe someone who, you're a Christian, but you know you've just not prioritized things. If that's you, would you just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying with? Yeah, that's great. I see you. That's good. This is important. This will set you up. If you can get this one right, this will set you up. Let me just pray for you. Lord Jesus, we lay ourselves down. We renew our citizenship to heaven. We are allegiant to you and you alone. We, we won't go down the road of, of waging so deep into the culture, wa culture wars and to the political things and the polarizations that, that don't represent well the citizenship of heaven. We prioritize the kingdom of heaven, God. We say your will be done. Your will be done, not ours. We want to align ourselves with your agenda. We lay down our personal preference. We, we have grace toward those we disagree with. We love those who might hate us. God, we don't fight evil with evil, but we fight evil with good. We serve you and you alone. We serve King Jesus, and we serve in his kingdom. You are the ruler of all. In Jesus' name. I just want to leave you with this verse as we jump back into worship and respond. It says this in Matthew 6. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Whatever circumstance you're in, seek first the kingdom of God. Amen, amen. Hey, let's respond in worship. Let's declare that Jesus is Lord, that he's the one that rules all. Come on.